So today I'm going to tell you the four steps that I took to overcome my pornography addiction. A little bit of background, I had an extremely bad pornography addiction. In, I suppose, content and quantity. Uh, very, very bad. And I was in a really bad place in my life before, before I overcame this. Uh, really badly depressed. Uh, desperate, uh, the lowest point of my life, for sure, absolutely, the lowest point of my life was just before I did step one on this list. So I want to make this video. Somebody asked me um, if I could make a video on overcoming pornography, a porn addiction. Uh, I will probably make at some point a longer Yeoman University video and go into even more detail. There's lots to be said about this. Um, but I do think, I, I just want to get this out there because I think everyone's thinking about a pornography addiction wrong. I think all the methods out there don't work. I know because I've tried them all. Uh, but what I've done, these four steps, I haven't viewed pornography in years. I'm not the kind of person who I sit down and I track every single day. Ooh, I'm five days clean. I'm six days clean. I don't think that's actually healthy. Uh, it does seem to work for like for alcoholics and stuff like that. But I don't even know about that, to be honest with you. Um, I think most people don't address the root cause of pornography, of pornography addiction, that is. And because of that, they don't solve the problem. Either they can be a, a year clean and still mess up. You, you see that with some of these methods. Um, and I think if that's the case, again, it, it's, it's like you cured cancer and a year later the cancer comes back. You haven't really fixed the problem in that case. I think it's the same with pornography. I think you have to look at what the root cause of your pornography addiction is. And if you don't solve that, you're not going to solve the pornography addiction. Or if you do, you will develop another addiction. You will develop some other unhealthy habit to cover up this root problem. You'll start overeating, binge eating. You'll start, uh, you'll maybe just become a sex addict. Uh, you'll, instead of replicating the act, you start doing the act. You might start smoking. You might, there's lots that you could go get into drugs. You'll just replace one addiction with another. And so I believe that, that these four steps address the root cause, at least in my life. And again, um, I guess two more caveats to say. One is that this is personally what I did. So I can't give you a guarantee that it'll work in your life. I think it will. I, I think this will work. I think this is, I think I get to the root cause of pornography addiction in general. But this is simply what I did in my life. And maybe you have to adjust it to certainly one of the steps you will have to adjust to your life. That's just the nature of it. The other thing worth mentioning is that I'm a, a Catholic man. Uh, I guess you would call me a traditional Catholic, an Orthodox Catholic. But with that in mind, this is definitely coming from that place. If you're not Catholic, is there still something to worth seeing in this? I think absolutely. Well, first of all, you should convert. But second of all, step three and four apply to anybody. Step one and two are Catholic. There's just no way around that that this is what happened in my life. This is how I fixed this problem. I'm Catholic. So it's natural that some of what I did here is Catholic. It's a big part of my life. Obviously it's the most important part of my life. If you're not, so that's a caveat. If you're Catholic, great. If you're not Catholic, maybe skip the first two steps or listen and just in one ear out the other, however you want to do it. Uh, okay. This is actually the second time I've recorded this video too, because I was a little too nervous the first time. And I said, like, over and over as a filler word. So now, now I'm a little more confident in what I'm saying, even though it is a very touchy subject and, and we get a little, little personal here. So let's get into it. Uh, there are four steps, four steps that I took. They are simple <laughs> as the title. I don't know if I, in the title, I'll probably put easy. They are, but they're not, they're not easy, easy in quotation. They're simple, but they're not easy. The first step was the consecration to Jesus through Mary as written about by St. Louis de Montfort. Again, like I warned you, very Catholic. If you're not Catholic, this probably sounds cuckoo. It sounds weird. <coughs> Excuse me. But basically, the bishop of my diocese said that everyone in the diocese 
should the diocese I used to be a part of, um, I've moved, said that everyone should make this consecration. And the consecration, basically, if you want the basics of it, I recommend you read the book. I've actually got it on my shelf here. Right here. This is the book, True Devotion to Mary, with Preparation for Total Consecration by St. Louis de Montfort. You can get it from Tan Books. They're a pretty good publisher, by the way. Um, don't buy it off Amazon. That's the spawn of the devil. <laughs> I don't know how much I'm joking about that. But uh, the point, you should get the book. Basically, what the consecration is doing is that you're making a consecration so that every prayer you offer to God is first, like, goes through Mary in order that she can present that to God. If that makes sense, you think about, again, if you're not Catholic, this is meaningless, and it probably sounds, you think it's, like, idolatrous or something, because I don't know why you think that. But it, basically the reasoning behind it is that Mary is the mother of God, who is going to be a better advocate before God than Mary. Just like in the Bible, you see people ask Job to pray for them because Job is a holy man. They don't want to pray for these intentions themselves. I mean, you still should do that. But they don't want to come before God themselves because they think they'll just be smitten down because they're bad people. I am certainly a bad person or was a bad person or however you want to look at that. And so I'm offering up my prayers to God, but having Mary present them to God. Does that make sense? Like if I was going to give an apple to someone and she polishes it before giving it. Does that make sense? If it doesn't make sense, read the book. I'm not going to say I'm some theologian who's going to explain this well. But that's the basic idea behind it. I made that consecration. The, uh, the bishop said we should. My parish took it very seriously. And everyone in my parish, I think probably everyone, maybe almost everyone, made the consecration. I did not make the consecration well. Like I said, I was at a very low point of my life. And... Um, yeah, a very, very, the lowest point of my life. I did not make the consecration well, but I, through the grace of God, I did it. And the priest said, um, right before the consecration, I was actually thinking about not doing it. Um, and right before it, he said, we have had people praying for the intention of people who have done it badly, who have missed a step or not done a step well, or whatever the case. We have been praying specifically to help do those steps for you, to help fill in the gaps of like of what you haven't uh done well and so i said fine okay i'll do it and that really was a turning point in my life after that it has been an uphill trajectory an upward trajectory the ever since then and so obviously i do recommend it because it worked very well in my case again if you're not catholic it's, it's probably meaningless to you um and again i would read more into it if you're if you're listening to that and like what that doesn't sound right just read more into it there's there's more to it but Short, short version. Um, this is not a theological <laughs> episode. This is just the four things I did. Um, after doing that, and I guess uh, uh, to mention, there's a step zero here, which was realizing I had a problem, realizing that there's probably a root cause to the problem. Um, and the, how I realized that, and also how I did step two, was listening to sermons from a, a particular priest um, you're not really supposed to say what the priest's name is, but there's a podcast online that's like all of his sermons. And it is, I believe it's Veritas Caritas. You should look it up. It's all of his sermons online, or a lot of his sermons. Not not in the past couple of years, but uh, really, really good. I, I could not recommend it enough. And in one of those sermons, he talks about that you that you have the ability as a Catholic, again, very Catholic here, to offer up the Eucharist for an intention. Um at Mass, you can offer up the Mass for an intention, and you can offer up the sacrifice of the Mass for an intention. Um, like, when the Eucharist is being held up, you attach mentally your, your intention uh, to that, if that makes sense. There's, again, there's more to it, and I don't want to go into a whole theological discussion here, but that is the idea. And he said you should do that if you have some sort of personal problem, you have a problem with something like pornography. I don't know if he said pornography specifically, but I think it was pretty clear he was talking about problems like that, that there is a root cause and you need to, you should offer the Eucharist up for healing that when you receive the Eucharist in a state, in, in a state of grace, not a state of mortal sin, let's be clear. Don't receive the Eucharist. If you're not in a state of grace, okay, that's a mortal sin. Don't do it. But if you're in a state of grace, you've gone to confession. You, when you receive the Eucharist, and you receive God, his body, his blood, soul, and divinity, you ask that Jesus enter into your heart 
and heal every part of it. Every, like, let no part of your heart be hidden and let every part of it be healed, even the parts that are painful, even if parts of it might bring to light things you don't want to talk about, things you don't want to think about. Let every part of it be healed. And if you do have problems, even this, the, this priest warned this, this will be painful. And this will potentially cause problems in your life in the, sh in the short term. But that is what is required for healing. And, and you need to offer up the Eucharist with that intention. So that was step two. Again, very Catholic so far. Um, having done step two, personally in my own life, this led to the realization of things in my past that were really, 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 really not good. Um, I realized that there was a lot of abuse and neglect in my childhood. And there was stuff that I had just always... There were two things, really. There was one that was a memory I had had my entire life um, that I never really thought about. And after making the this offering off making this um asking for my soul to be healed after doing that this memory was on my mind a lot and when i finally confronted it and thought about it i realized what it was a memory of I'm not going to get specific here but it's really really bad and i realized oh wow i was abused as a kid this was really really bad uh, and then there were also other things that I thought about more that I thought were just normal. And they were not. And I realized that. And so that was the painful after effect of step two. And it re I realized that these things, these childhood traumas, were the cause of my addiction. And I think that's basically the case for anyone who has a pornography addiction is that there is some childhood trauma that is is causing it and that you need to address that to fix it. And considering how many people have a pornography addiction, if that's true, what I'm saying, we should all treat our kids better. That's uh, That would be my, uh, my prognos prognos prognosis, prognosis. But, so having done this, having realized this, step three was the the next the next step so i suppose step two and a half is applicable even if you're not catholic even if you don't want to do step one and two which is find out what your major malfunction is may find out the the childhood trauma whatever is causing you to be covering things up with this addiction whatever you are coping or self-soothing or self-sabotaging or or self-abusing because of and find out what that is and then step three was to address that. And by address that, I meant I went to my family and confronted them about it. Told them what I was thinking, just honestly what I was thinking. And some of the stuff was still continuing, if that makes sense. I didn't live with them. There wasn't some sort of physical abuse or something that was going on. Not in that way. But there was... I don't want, without going into specifics, there was stuff that it was still not resolved. They had never, and I don't just mean that they had never apologized for it or anything like that, though that was simply, that was obviously true. I don't, I shouldn't say obviously. <laughs> Hopefully in your case, that's not the case. But there were still problems in the relationship between me and my family that I didn't realize until then. To be clear, some people know a little bit about my family because I mentioned it before. I mentioned it even in these videos. You know, my parents were on meth, for instance. And so I am talking about that, but my parents, I only lived with them until about the age of five. Then I was adopted by my grandparents. And part of this realization was realizing that they weren't any better. And they didn't even have the excuse of being on meth. So, yeah, that was painful for sure. That was not an easy thing to realize. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that none of my family is religious. That's, that's semi-important to how this turns out. I think if you have a religious family, like if you're Catholic listening to this, um, and you address, you confront your, you have a similar situation to mine, and you address your Catholic family, it might go better. It might. It might not. I, I can't really make a guarantee of that any anyway. But my family, not religious. Uh, 
my most of my family is atheist some of them are vaguely protestant or vaguely deist or something they kind of believe in something um the closest the only catholic i have in my family is a distant great aunt or something who married an italian and they're nominally catholic um they are baptized and everything i shouldn't i shouldn't say that like they aren't catholic they are baptized they they are a part of the church but they don't practice really very much uh, but anyway so t- t- come to mass two times a year is i guess what <laughs> how you have the best way to describe it right um Although I don't know, I haven't seen him in years, so maybe 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 they've gotten better. Who knows? But so I confronted my family about this, and there was kind of two confrontations. One was very calm, and it wasn't really a confrontation. It was just I was trying to get more information, and the second was a was a confrontation. The first, I just there was one event in particular that. I remember happening and thinking was really, really bad now that I remember, now that I'm thinking about it. And so I went to my grandma specifically. I asked her about it. Do you remember this? Do you remember this happening? Because I wanted to find out, like, if she had done anything about it that I just didn't remember or if she even knew about it. I was thinking she had to have. And I asked her about it and she said, oh, yeah, I remember that. There was also that other time. And I was blown away. Like, what, what do you mean that other time? And she goes on to tell me about this other time where I specifically asked her for help because of some thing that was really bad, that was abusive, that had happened to me. And I asked her for help about it. I was crying. I was a little kid, you know. And and I asked her when she's telling me the story, like, did you do anything? Did you... I don't want to ask... I don't want to go into the details of, like, what I asked her because I would give away what I'm talking about. <coughs> Excuse me. But... I asked, like, did you do this? Did you do that? Did you do anything? And the answer was no. Uh, She didn't really care to do anything about it. And at that point, I thought about that for probably another month or so before I had the actual confrontation of here's what I've been thinking. Here are the problems I have. Um, Here are the problems that are still continuing in some ways. Uh, This is not healthy. We can't keep going on like this. And the result of that conversation, which is step three, the result of that conversation was that they got, ext- my family, that side of my family at least, the other side of my family is just was so distant, I'd never even had any real connection with a lot of them. <clears throat> but that whole side of my family uh, disowned me, and I have not talked to them in years. Haven't seen them, haven't talked to them. Um, I'm not seeking them out. I'll tell you that I pray for them, but, uh, it was not, if, if they, they, this is something that is apparently worryingly common is that if you bring up, basically, this is the thing they knew, obviously they knew that they were neglectful, abusive, that they, these different things, they, they knew that. And me bringing it up was not me bringing them some news. It was just they just blamed me for causing them the discomfort of having to think about the fact that they treated children as badly as they did. That's, that's a simple, it it really doesn't get any simpler than that. And so instead of trying to address that, make it up to me in some way, apologize, um, they, well, I could go into some more of what they what they said. There's stuff like, for instance, when I talked to my grandma, she said she would say the words "I'm sorry," but she'd say "I'm sorry," but it was actually your brother's fault. It's like, what? Excuse? Like she would just? And then I would talk about how that's ridiculous and kind of evil to blame my brother, who's younger than me, as if he's somehow to blame for this. And so then she she would just say "I'm sorry," but it was your grandpa's fault. I'm sorry, but it was just. If someone says, I'm sorry, but it's not, it's not an apology. And then, you know, she cut me out and I haven't, haven't talked to her in years. And, uh, again, it's, it was a dysfunctional relationship and I've told her after she, they've all cut me out. I've just told them just, I don't want any contact unless, uh, something's going to change, <laughs> right? Like this, this relationship we had until the, the confrontation cannot continue that is not healthy it is doing me harm it is doing you harm because what you're doing is evil 
and if I pretend like what you're doing is not evil, then I am allowing evil. And you, like, you could legitimately be damned to hell for the evil that you've done, because what they did was certainly mortal sins, because I stand by and pretend there's nothing wrong with it. Like, I have a responsibility even to them to do that. Res honor their, thy mother and father, although this is like grandmother and grandfather, doesn't mean do everything they say. I, honoring them is trying to do my best, the only thing that might save them from eternal damnation, to be completely honest. But, so, after this, uh, immediately after, I felt like I was the craziest fucking person on the planet. I just, like, I'm fucking crazy. I'm crazy. I am so happy I talked to my brothers beforehand, because they, they backed me up. Because you get, if you do, if you go through this process, um, because you have a similar family situation, um, you will be gaslighted to the extreme. And I'm so happy I had talked to my brothers, because I would have just been like, did that happen? Did it happen? Am I crazy? I'm crazy. Nobody would do this. Nobody would do this. Nobody would ever confront their family like this. I am crazy. I must be crazy. And I still thought that a bit, but it would have been even worse if I hadn't talked to my uh, to the members of my family who were like on my side, um, which was the younger members of my family who also experienced similar things. And they told me, absolutely, ab you are correct here. This is, yes, you are not crazy. And that helped a lot for sure. Um, and then the next day after sleeping and like, I felt amazing. It was, it was, it was a weight lifted off me. It was, I, I felt like I had, I had been healed of this problem. And since then, maybe there was like at the very beginning, a couple of mess ups. I can't remember exactly, but pr in pretty short order since then, I have not view viewed pornography since it has, it has been completely just, it was gone. Like the, 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 it was a coping mechanism for a problem I didn't have anymore because my, my, because these people who had abused me were still in my life, my brain was still in emergency mode. It was still in this mode that I needed to cope with this problem. With the moment they weren't in my life anymore. And again, preferably you go through this process and the problem is fixed in, not in that way, but in that they're in your life, but in a, with a better relationship. Um, and then you're not in emergency mode either, but in my circumstance, they were no longer in my life. And so my brain, that part of my brain that was, that was in emergency and was coping with this was just shut off. And the compulsion was just no longer there. And the, there was still some, like, there was still some addiction, some physical things. And that's why you might be asking like, well, why is there a step four? Step four came later. And that is the easy peasy method which is a method a lot of people have used to quit pornography. I think by itself, even just by itself, it's a pretty good method, but I think it still doesn't address the root cause and you might end up getting addicted to something else or whatever. But basically until the easy peasy method, I was not jacking off. I was not viewing pornography. It, I was cured really after step three, but I still had the occasional temptation and I never fell into it, but I, I, I it still was something I had to think about. And there was a little bit of a struggle there. Like it wasn't bad. It was so much, so much improved and I never fell into it. But after doing the easy peasy method, it's never even on my mind. It's just gone. Like the actual addiction itself is, was gone. Um, so listening to this, there's a few thoughts you might have. One is that that is not at all what I fucking expected for this four step plan <laughs> in any way that I understand. I understand a hundred percent that that is probably not what you expected. Number two, you might be thinking that, uh, are you telling me that in order to fix my problem, I have to break all contact with my family? No, I really hope that does not happen to you, but I do think you'll need to address childhood trauma. I think that is the root cause. And the other question you, uh, actually, I don't know if there's another question that you might have. That's it. That really is the four step process. I think, um, you, uh, other suggestions I would say is with the easy peasy method, they recommend a like one last time thing. I don't recommend that evil may not be done. That good may come of it. That's my, that's, that's where I stand on that. I also, you might want to get a therapist. I didn't get a therapist. I used a priest. I, I used a few priests actually, but, and I recommend that absolutely. 
But you can also get a good Catholic therapist. I've seen other people who had very good success with good Catholic therapists. You should you should vet them. You need to vet therapists very you need to ask them questions on the first time. When they that first session when they're kind of almost interviewing you, you need to be interviewing them and finding out how they feel about different things. Because that'll tell you how they'll respond when you bring these things up and stuff like that. But anyway, um, I would also say, what else is there to say? It's crazy, I know. I know it sounds crazy. But I really do think that the, the cause, the root cause of a pornography addiction or any addiction is childhood trauma. At least nine times out of ten. And this is, when you address the root cause, it really does, you can really solve the problem. Instead of just just bandaging overing, you're, you, I I think a lot of the methods that people talk about, getting a accountability partner, or keeping track of your days with little tokens like alcoholics do, I think that's just putting a bandage over an internal wound. And if you address the root problem, things can really get better. And my life has improved to such an extreme. And I, I think no part of these four steps, I would have been able to do it without. Do I think in theory someone could do it without if they just had step three, for instance? Well, actually, I know in practice. I know people, I know someone who has had a similar situation who did just the, the third three, the, the last three steps. They didn't do the consecration to Jesus through Mary, but they did the other steps. And they've had great success with that. Um, I've So, yes, I, I know that it, it somewhat depends on you, whether. but I'm telling you these are the four steps I did. I don't think personally I would have been able to go as far as I did to get my life in order without this. And now my life is amazing. I mean, it really has been an upward trajectory ever since step one. Um, I highly recommend the consecration. I, I, I recommend offering up the Eucharist for your intentions more than almost. And I mean, all these steps are extremely important, but that has been like the secret. I, I must not be a very holy person because they talk about how like it, the most faithful people are faithful. You don't need proof. God has given me so much proof of his existence in my life that I, the most atheist man on the planet could not doubt God's existence with what he has done in my life. And I, I, a lot of that I give to, I, I, um, comes from offering up intentions with the Eucharist. And the third step, I mean, is sort of the centerpiece of this whole thing. So, uh, yeah, I, I, if you have questions, if you, I might talk more about this if you have specifics questions you have or um i don't know if you have if you have anything you want to say about it you want to call me crazy or uh yeah i don't know definitely um let me know what you think but i will tell you that this is there's a reason i put the easy in the title if i do remember to do this in quotations this is simple it's a simple four-step process it is not easy it is not easy but after it's done um it's, I'm living a different life, right? It is, it is, it's worth it. Really, it really is. It's worth it. Uh, I, w I, I really don't believe that if I did not do these four steps, I would not have overcome my pornography addiction. I would not have done various improvements in my life, just moving to a new place and, and uh, starting a business and all this stuff. I would not have been able to do any of that. Finding my fiance, who is perfect for me, Absolutely. If she watches this, she watches these videos. So, hey, babe. Uh, d absolutely perfect for me. I I would never have found her, just to begin with, would never have been the kind of person worth having a fiancé at all. Like, none of it would have happened without doing every single one of these four steps. I'm, I, I'm absolutely convinced. So, uh, with that, again, take it as as you will these are these i'm not guaranteeing this will work for you though i think it will and these are my four steps i took to overcome my pornography addiction i hope you the best uh, if you're watching this i imagine you probably have a pornography addiction or know somebody who does i really really i pray that everyone watching this um overcomes it i hope this is of some use to you i feel dirty doing the next part which is if it is of some use to you you can donate below um, I do appreciate it. It helps me make more of these because, well, honestly, it helps me feed my ducks who will starve without enough money. <laughs> feed is expensive. So if you would like to, uh, feed my ducks and my dogs, um, who I will be putting videos of probably soon. Anyway, uh, then 
please donate just whatever you think this is worth if you find value in this whatever you think that value is that's all i ask but anyway and if you have no money just share this around i'm, I'm hopefully this is something useful that you'll want to share around i, I hope but anyway uh thanks for watching god bless bye, -bye.